असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शांति 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 ओम लीड अस फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल लीड अस फ्रॉम डार्कनेस एंड टू लाइट लीड अस फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोटैलिटी ओम पीस 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 नमस्ते एंड गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी आई वाज जस्ट थिंकिंग दैट व्हाट व्हाट वी जस्ट चांटेड नाउ um lead us from the unreal to the real lead us from darkness to light lead us from death to immortality in the subject this morning at uh, the knowledge of the ultimate reality tattva gyana the ultimate reality brahman is what answers to these what is reality brahman ultimate reality what is light in the sense of pure consciousness in the sense of knowledge or enlightenment also it is brahman what is immortality it is brahman so the prayer the chant which we did just now um, it uh, answers to today's uh, subject the knowledge of ultimate reality what was the line we were just singing just not things all things are full of brahman what does it filled full with brahman oh it's filled full with brahman are the things we see and it was that uh, eric or john sh- okay frederick manchester and swami prabhavanand ji yeah filled full with brahman are the things we see so you may ask uh, this ultimate reality brahman where is it the things we see here filled full with brahman uh, and so is it like a container or a glass which is filled with water so everything has been filled with brahman no it's not like that it's like this rather this uh, lectern which is if i say it's filled full with wood what it means is it is wood it's made of wood and there's nothing here except touch wood yeah? so this similarly brahman um, alone is that's what we we experience as the things of the world it's a very very radical idea in non dual vedanta advaita vedanta when uh, mary hale uh, right here in fact i think uh, uh, she uh, asked she wrote to swami vivekananda i she wrote this poem i i have understood what you have taught that everything is god he wrote back in a poem that i have never taught such uh, a strange doctrine that all is god what i have said or what i meant because he did say that all is god a number of times but he said what i meant is uh, that god alone is all is not filled full with brahman are the things we see it means not that the things we see are filled with brahman brahman alone is what we are seeing experiencing is brahman but how do we know that how do we come to realize it that's our subject this morning and the book i'm going to share this insight from i have been reading verses from this once in a while now this is called the nectar of supreme knowledge its original sanskrit name is uh, yoga vashishta sara the essence of yoga uh, yoga vashishta the essence of yoga vashishta it's a translation of the sanskrit original by swami sarva devananda ji who is uh, the vedanta society of southern california and uh, so this book has an interesting background the original book is the yoga vashishta which is a beloved ancient and beloved and vast sanskrit original text of non dual vedanta the original has 30000 verses and this has less than 300 less than 1% so it's less than that book is over 100 times the size of this book and this is less than 100th of that book of those 30000 verses some unknown author the author of this book is unknown the sanskrit original of this book yoga vashishta sara the some original author um, probably a monk lived about 400 500 years ago extracted just over 200 verses from the original yoga vashishta sara original 30000 verses and divided those 200 into 10 chapters 
And so we have this book. And I've been reading occasionally from it. Um, the, and this book also is supplemented, it's rich because the Yoga Vashishta Sara was translated into Bengali by Swami Dhiresh Anandaji, a uh, senior monk of our order, several decades ago. And what Swami Dhireshanti did was he took those verses, he translated them into Bengali and added a lot of information about Advaita Vedanta in that as supplementary information. So it becomes a very rich volume about non-dual Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta. And this English translation has a translation of those notes of Swami Dhireshanti also. So what I'll say also draws upon the information supplied by Swami Dhireshananda. The original book, the original book, Yoga Vashishta, the context is the Prince Rama, who is of course an incarnation of God, of Vishnu. Um, he is suddenly taken up with the idea of non-dual Vedanta, that I am Brahman, as we all are, and decides not to do anything else in the world and be, you know, be a monk and become enlightened. So he decides, I will not you know, be the king or do my princely duties and so on and so forth. His father, of course, very naturally is worried what will happen to the kingdom. Uh, so he engages the royal sage Vasishta uh, to explain things, to convince the young prince, you know, to step up and do his duties, fulfill his responsibilities and so on. And so Vasishta speaks to Rama and says, it's wonderful that you want to become enlightened and realize that you're Brahman. But tell me, the world that you want to give up, is Brahman something other than this world? Is the world something other than Brahman? Let's put it that way. Is the world something other than Brahman? We all know, filled full with Brahman are the things that we see. Rama apparently did not know. So <laughs> he had to be, so basically that's what Vashishta tells him. Uh, what the half the line which we heard, filled full with Brahman are the things we see. Vasishta tells him that, but in 30,000 Sanskrit verses. And the idea being that you don't have to run away from this. In fact, if you do run away from this to something else, you're making some kind of, there is a lack of clarity about what, what we are seeking. Swami Vivekananda put it so powerfully. He who runs away to meditate and die in a Himalayan cave has missed the way. He who plunges headlong into the foolishness and the vanities, the luxuries of life and vanities, uh, he has missed the way. So if you plunge into life, you grab life and plunge into life, you have missed the way. And if you run away from all of these engagements and want to sit in a mountain cave and meditate, you have missed the way. Then what is the way? It seems to be a binary. There are only two things to do. And Vivekananda says, so this is Vedanta, what Vivekananda says next. The way is to divinize life itself. It is to see the divinity, the ultimate reality in those we are with, in everything that we do, in our surroundings, and most of, most of all within ourselves. I'm paraphrasing what Vivekananda said. Again, the way is to see filled full with Brahman other things we see. And that's the message of this book and how to realize that. The verse that I'm going to take up is from the third mm -hmm. chapter, is the first verse of the third chapter. The name of the third chapter is the knowledge of ultimate reality, Tattva Jnana. That's the subject this morning. The first verse goes like this. Tattvatma bodhai vaika sarvashatrina pavakaha prokta samadhi shabdena natu tushnim avasthitihi The realization of the oneness with Brahman, that Brahman is Atman, that is like a burning fire which, um, which burns up the dried pieces of grass, which are the desires of the world. All worldly desires are burned up by that pure fire, which burns away all the desires of worldly enjoyments. That is verily termed samadhi. That's called samadhi, not merely sitting in silence. Tattva Atma Bodha, Tattva Ultimate Reality, Brahman. Atma Bodha, Self-Realization. So that Brahman I am, what is the nature of enlightenment? Not that there is an ultimate reality, not that God exists, not that there is a Buddha nature. But the, uh, the realization, enlightenment is, I am that. See, until you realize what you are, until we realize what we are, 
of what ultimate import is it to know that there is some you know it's as you might as well know that there is a black black hole or that there, there are super strings good that's very interesting oh so there is a god or there is brahman or something but i am that that makes all the difference to me so that makes all the difference to me one uh, of a very senior swamis swami premeshanandi this is a, one of the anecdotes i heard about him he was a disciple of ma sharada and regarded as enlightened in his own lifetime so this elderly gentleman who was very young at that time but when i met him was elderly he used to go to swami premeshanandi ji and he had this habit of visiting different holy men and he would go and tell swami premeshanandi about you know he saw this yogi who has such and such power he met this holy person who does this kind of a special meditation practice and what not all these interesting stories and swami premeshanandi would listen and one day he said um i'll tell you in bengali and then i'll translate what he said the gentleman's name was badal babu so badal um which means cloud <laughs> so um so he says to him my dear cloud he would say uh ore badla sara jagat tai jodi ram krishna hoye jay tate tori baki ar amari baki if the whole world becomes sri ram krishna and why such a yogi or such a master or such a teacher why that let's go even further let's go the full distance you know and say that let everybody become equal to sri ram krishna everybody all of them are sri ram krishna except you and me then at the end of the day what good is it to you or is to me tattvatma bodhah i must realize i am that and that makes all the difference to me and it'll make a difference to others also ultimately Ev ekaha. This is the only, only way of uh, becoming enlightened and ri- uh, going beyond samsara and saving ourselves. Only. Sarva shatri na prava kaha. And its result is the destruction, the burning to a crisp of all that which ties us to this world, our desires, uh, in which we makes us cling to this world, the Buddha's insight. You remember the four noble truths of the Buddha: dukkham, all is suffering. Why are we in this world of suffering? Why are we suffering? He says, next noble truth: trishna, this thirst for uh, things in the world. I must continue to exist, and things must be just so. Otherwise, I'm un- unhappy. Well, guaranteed, you have asked, prescribed yourself unhappiness. <laughs> and then um, what, is there any solution to this problem the buddha said yes there is a solution he called it nirvana nirvana means extinguishing extinguishing what not yourself extinguishing practically it would mean extinguishing this one this uh, all that that thirst for worldliness the worldly things in the world, uh, which we which ties us to samsara sarva shatrina pavaka the trina means dried grass Bhavaka is a fire which burns, also literally purifies. It burns away those these things. Practically, it means that. Or deeper sense, it would mean overcoming the ignorance which ties us to worldliness. The, that that will only come according to Vedanta. It will only come by the realization of our true nature. And the realization of true nature is that it is the ultimate reality. It is Brahman. Prokta samadhi shabdena. The next line is interesting. It's a dig at yogis. Prokta samadhi shabdena. This is what is meant by samadhi. We talk about samadhi, meditative absorption. Prokta samadhi shabdena. This is what is samadhi, the realization that I am Brahman, not sitting silently, not sitting quietly. Nato tushnim avasti tushni, silently and quietly sitting. What are you doing? Samadhi. Sometimes a little rumbling sound comes. <laughs> What happened? It happened actually. So talk was going on in the, in the foothills of the Himalayas. A talk on Vedanta. There was little rumbling sound in the background. Um, and the Swami was giving a talk, and he said, you know, Hindi. Kya hua, Mishra ji? What happened, Mr. Mishra? And he comes to with a start and said, Tanik samadhi lag gaye. A little bit of samadhi. I had a little samadhi. <laughs> it's a natural consequence of vedanta just, if you hear such high metaphysics on a sunday morning uh, samadhi is inevitable it puts you to samadhi <laughs> swami saradanand ji 
uh, he, a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, was here in the Vedanta Society, he used to give talks. I think this was probably in, um, I don't know where it was, maybe in the Vedanta Society in New York itself. And uh, Miss Josephine McLeod, uh, uh, one of the closest associates of Swami Vivekananda, she would never agree to call herself a disciple. She would say, I'm a friend of Vivekananda. <laughs> Uh, and so she would, after Vivekananda passed, she did a tremendous amount of work for um, the Ramakrishna mission and for India itself. So in the, here in New York, she would attend the talks and she would ask the Swami, Swami, did you sleep well? You know, last night, did you sleep well? And this, then one day the Swami was giving a talk and Josephine McLeod happened to be in the front row and she dozed off, nodded off. So after the talk, the Swami asked her, Madam, did you sleep well? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little anecdote about this, which will illustrate what this uh, line is trying to say. Not sitting silently. This is called Samadhi. The realization that I am Brahman is called Samadhi. Not sitting silently. Or not merely sitting silently. You can come to a realization that you are Brahman when you are sitting silently in meditation. Let's not knock meditation. So I was in the uh, Himalayas, in the high Himalayas in Gangotri, and this young monk I met, he was from Nepal, his name was, I still remember, Shiva Hari Giri, and he was really young, he was like 20, 19, 20, maybe 21 years old. He was practicing yoga, meditation, in a cave, and uh, it was very spectacular. He sat in the cave, it was on the ledge, and there was a sheer drop below to the Bhagirathi, the river uh, rushing by below. He was very simple and uh, and sweet. I asked him, "Oh, you sit there?" And he said, "Yes." Uh, and from the other bank, the tourists come and take my picture and like it. <laughs> they think this is, people think this is perfect. Here is uh, the Himalayas, and here is a cave, and, and there's a yogi too, <laughs> sitting and meditating too. But they don't know he's meditating on them, taking a picture of him. <laughs> but anyway, he was quite sincere. Um, he was trying to attain samadhi, uh, the yogic samadhi. And I asked him, with my predilection for Vedanta, I asked him, so have you read, Mr. Vedanta kuch padha hai, have you studied Vedanta? And he said, yes, probably his Sanskrit was weak, so he had studied it in Hindi. He said, I've read, read the Upanishads and the commentaries of Shankara in Hindi. So I said, what do you think? What do you think of Vedanta? And his answer was, I'll tell you in Hindi and translate, Bahut baat karte hai, anubhuti nahi hai inki. They, they, they talk a lot. <laughs> There are lots of talking, you know, lots of books and lectures and discussions and arguments. They don't have spiritual experience. So this is an ancient um, little tiff between the yogis and the jnanis. Yogis means the meditators, or those on the path of meditation. They're all yoga. This is jnana yoga. The way of knowledge is also a yoga. The way of devotion is also a yoga. The way of meditation is also a yoga. What does... Uh, the way of meditation say, you go to the classic text of meditation, which is the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, and it says, self-realization. Yes, self-realization. That is the goal. But how do you have self-realization? It says, yoga chitta vritti nirodha. Nowadays people go around with t-shirts, which says, yoga chitta vritti nirodha. Cessation of the movements of the mind is called yoga. So in meditation, you sit down first, you calm down the body, cut out the world, uh, shut the doors of the senses, and then turn the mind inward and settle the movements of the mind, the thoughts, the memories, the random you know, chattering away of the mind. Settle it. Focus it. How do you settle it? Not go to sleep. You focus it. Settle by focusing. From many thoughts and uh, movements to one thought. And then to drop that also. So, yoga chitta vritti nirodha. What good does that do? Tada drashtu sarupe avasthanam. Um, when you, if you manage that, how would you manage that? The whole of the yoga technology is there. Dashtanga yoga, not the physical part of it. The uh, first, the ethical practices, yama and niyama. Uh, you must have an ethical life first. Then you must know how to sit. And then breathing. You have to learn how to sit and breathe. Yes, <laughs> we don't sit well, and we don't breathe well either. Uh, I, I remember reading this yoga master. One of the, I think it was either BKS, probably BKS Iyengar, lights on yoga. So he, he wrote that when I first came to the United States, I was amazed to find that these people are hardly breathing at all. 
They become so tense, you know, shoulders and chest and stomach. They are only a little bit of upper chest breathing they are doing. The diaphragmatic breathing they are not doing. So I have to teach them how to breathe properly first. And this is, a, this is not just breathing properly. This is a higher science of breathing, the pranayama, to control the flow of prana in the body, to quieten the mind. So this is a very specific use of the breath, to quieten the mind. Then you have to withdraw the senses, pratyahara, then focus, dharana, then meditation, dhyana, and then hopefully, after long practice, samadhi. So when you have that samadhi, and samadhi is of different grades, the ultimate, the highest in that, uh, in that tradition is called asampragyata samadhi. Then what happens? Remember, the goal is always self-knowledge. So this is in that state, when the mind is absolutely still, the self is realized in its, rea in its own nature. Or the self remains in its real nature. The self remains in its real nature. Um, that Tada uh, drashtu swarupe avasthanam The seer, drashtu means, uh, uh, the drashta means the seer, the witness self. Swarupe, in its real nature, avasthanam, stays. And Swami Vivekananda gives the classic example of a lake. Imagine a lake where the water is very pure and the water is still. And then you can see through to the bottom of the lake. Imagine glassy, pure water and still water. You can see through to the bottom of the lake. Okay, this is the basic idea in yoga. So you must be quiet. We must be very, very quiet, very, very still, very, very quiet. And there's a whole technology uh, for spiritual technology for attaining that. If you don't do it, if you are not quiet, if your mind breaks out into waves, into thoughts, memories, um, just random chatter, what happens? The next sutra says it. Ritti sarupya mitaratra. So these are very cryptic statements. These are sutras, like aphorisms. Not like aphorisms, they are aphorisms. So they have to be unpacked. Vritti sarupya mitaratra means otherwise at other times when you are not meditating, when your mind is not stilled in meditation and samadhi, whatever breaks out on the surface of your mind, the self becomes identified with that. So anger, I am angry. Not that I am the pure consciousness illumining a movement on the surface of my mind of the form of anger. Nobody says that. I am mad at you. We say that. <laughs> So we become identified with it. Our real nature is no longer apparent. And what's that real nature? According to yoga, it is pure consciousness. Sankhya, yoga, they are allied systems. And they say we are pure being, pure consciousness. Uh, so the purusha, awareness itself. All right. So this is what is being criticized here. They're taking a dig at this. What could be the problem with this? Look at two other paradigms before we come to this jnana paradigm, the paradigm of knowledge. Let's look at the bhakti paradigm, for example. What will they say about this? They will say, no, why should we sit like that? What silliness? I will think. I will think about my beloved Krishna, for example. Hmm. Or my beloved Rama. Why sit quiet when I can think of my beloved Lord? Why keep silent? Yogis say, mauna, don't talk. Why keep silent when I can repeat the name of the Lord? The bhaktas, ap the approach of the lover of God is a different paradigm altogether. They will not agree with this. Yeah. They will say this might be, at best it might be a calming device. Mm, you know, calm down. And then stop thinking of the world. They will agree with that. But think of the beloved Lord. Well, my Lord God, I will think about that. I will pray to God. I will visualize God. I will repeat the name, the mantra the, um, given by my Guru. Why should I sit quietly? What a waste of time. Yeah. What a waste of life, <laughs> sitting quietly. Is that what you are born to do, sit quietly? Yeah. So the Bhakta will disagree on other grounds. On the grounds that uh, the, the right use of our time, our mind, our body is to Serve the Lord is to pray to the Lord, is to love God, is to contemplate on God. The very best use of the tongue is to repeat the name of God, not sit quietly. So that would be the devotee's criticism uh, of this. What is the criticism here? The criticism here is that even if you sit quietly, if all goes well, this is the core understanding from Swami Dhiraishanda's notes I'm saying, if all goes well with your approach, you will realize I am the witness consciousness. But what will not go away is the uh, 
implicit idea that I am still somehow limited. Here is a body, here is a mind, here is my personal life. And quite apart from me, there are millions and millions of other beings. I am just one limited being. One tiny little being in, the, in our horizons about this universe are further and further expanding. In the vastness, in the unimaginable vastness of space, I am this vanishingly small corner, this little being. In this endless ocean of time, I am a fleeting, instantaneous, vanishing point, um, you know, uh, evanescent, transient, few years, blink of an eye from the, for the universe, much less than that. In time, I am so tiny. As an object, I am so tiny. In space, I am so tiny. In time, I am so, so little. And my life uh, here is, seems completely insignificant, weak, helpless, fleeting, pointless. This is what I am. Now, at best, you will see that I am an immortal awareness, a point of awareness. But that's still a tiny part of this whole. And not only that, it's still subject to the risings, the movements of the body, the prana and the mind. The moment I come out of samadhi, yeah. again the mind is going to start functioning and I'm going to get mixed up with the mind. Not that samadhi will not have any effect. Samadhi will definitely train my mind and give, give me tremendous peace and quiet, a much better state. But still, it's quite far from what Advaita Vedanta wants to tell us. The tattva atma bodha, realization I am limitless existence consciousness place. How would that realization be different? There, once we have that realization, in deep meditation, in samadhi, you will find the same Brahman. As We shall investigate it more deeply today. And then with eyes open in this world, interacting with the world, you will find the same reality. What we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, instead of covering up that reality, will reveal that reality. See, let me ask you. This table, once we realize it is wood, and if it's given the shape of the table, do you think the wood has been obscured? That you have to really investigate, go deep, drill into it to find the wood? So no, Swami, this is what you're touching is wood. Mm. The whole bit of it. Suppose you play a movie on the screen. Has the screen been obscured? You, know, you don't seem sure. <laughs> no. In one sense, yes. In, but another sense, since you know what a movie is, a movie is pictures playing on a screen. So you know whatever movies you play, whatever pictures you are shown, you know it's the screen only. It's always there. That's what makes the movie possible. Similarly, the enlightened one, one who has got the realization of Brahman, I am Brahman, with eyes closed, with eyes open, it's uh, without any doubt, it's very clear to this person that I am Brahman. So that is the... Um, objective we are aiming at. That's what the criticism here is. If at all you have to criticize. One Vedantic monk put it this way. That if you think the ultimate reality, your real nature is available in samadhi and only in samadhi. In Hindi he said, Lo, apne pyare ko samadhi ki jail khane mein band kar diya. You have, you have um, thrown your beloved into the jail of samadhi and locked, thrown away the keys also. <laughs> only there it is available. However, uh, taking a step back before we go into the actual this, this knowledge of the ultimate reality of the self, let's uh, settle this dispute. It's a little unfair to the yogi because the yogi also, the goal in yoga is not to sit still. The goal there also is knowledge. It's called viveka khyati, the knowledge there. The knowledge there is of a different kind that I realize I am consciousness alone, different from the material body, mind, and world. The material body, mind, and world is called prakriti, nature, physical nature. And that's different. That's real. That's apart from me. It's just that because I did not see the distinction of myself as awareness from the physical body. I, I saw myself as a bundle of body, mind, you know, thoughts, emotions, and yes, awareness also. That contributed to my problem. That, that generated this bondage. Because whatever happens to the body, the sickness, I am sick. Um, wrinkles and old age, I am getting old, this is so terrible. Uh, mind, unhappiness, I am unhappy. So this body-mind association with that has, been cre has created the problem. And the seeing that I am the witness of the body-mind... I am not affected, it's the world which is changing, it's the body which is changing, it is the mind which is changing. 
This is the knowledge which arises in meditation, in, in samadhi, according to yoga. And it's permanent. Even after you come out of samadhi, it's also there. It's not that you have to stay in samadhi all the time. That's also, uh, you know, uh, an unfair criticism of, of yoga. I remember this great pandit, one of the greatest pandits in uh, Bengal at that time, a few decades back, uh, Murari Mohan Vedanta Di Shaptatitta. The one who was, it's like having, Saptatita would mean like having seven PhDs in Vedanta and Sankhya and all. So he was a, quite a character. I met him two or three times, always in public occasions. When I was a young monk and a speaker and there were other speakers and he would be the revered old pandit who would be called for presiding over these sessions. And uh, they were all interesting sessions. I'll come to the point but a couple of anecdotes to build up the <laughs> character. So he, he, um, he was famous not so much for his Vedanta and Sankhya and all. He was famous for his astrology. And he was proud of that too. <laughs> so people would go to him to have their futures foretold. And uh, he was very proud that uh, he had been called by India's greatest Bollywood film family for the greatest Bollywood uh, marriage that took place. That was decades ago. You know, Amitabh Bachchan's son and the films, all that, all of that. So he was called for consultation. There's some problem, astrological problem, and he resolved that. That was sort of the high point of his career. <laughs> Somebody asked him, Sir, you he had to yell because he was hard of hearing. He found, when I met him, he found it difficult to walk, he had to be carried up on the stage. And he could walk, but he couldn't go upstairs. So he would have to be carried on the stage and he had difficulty hard of hearing. So he had to yell on his one particular ear. <laughs> Somebody asked him, Sir, after studying so much of Vedanta and Sankhya and all these philosophies, why, why have you finally settled on astrology? <laughs> and he was a simple man actually in, in many ways. He would hear, what? And then you had to yell it back again to him and then he said, Oh, there is no money in Vedanta. <laughs> So he was like that, but uh, very. Uh, I mean, the papers carried uh, uh, obituaries about him when he passed away. He passed away just over a decade ago. He had to earn a living, yeah. Uh, unlike monks, yes. <laughs> so, uh, in fact, one of the papers carried uh, his obituary saying the last pundit. Uh, you know, is the last of the great. It's not the last pundit, but the sort of last of the greats, the traditional old pundits. Anyway, the anecdote now. So in one of these meetings, I thought, uh, I mean, he, he arrived early. I had arrived early. The audience was not there. Most of them were not there. And so the sp he was carried up to the stage. So I took this opportunity to go up to the stage and sit next to him. And I yelled out my question. I said, sir, what's the difference between this Sankhya dualism of consciousness and matter and the Vedantic non-dualism of consciousness only? And that repeated, you know, what? And I said it again, and then he said, oh, in Bengali I'll tell you, just two words. Drishti Parthokko, two different points of view merely. He said, these are merely two different points of view. So he said, these are two different, they are totally opposed philosophies. Shankara attacks Adi Shankaracharya in his Brahma Sutra Bhashya, strongly attacks the Sankhya philosophy. This, so this dig is not a one-off thing. There is an ancient debate going on. He strongly attacks this philosophy. In fact, he, um, if, you, if, if you ask why is he picking on the Sankhya philosophy, which is basically the science behind the yoga meditation. So why is he picking so much on that? And Shankaracharya says, Pradhana Manla Nyaya. The, it is the, uh, the um, let's say, the, the metaphor of the, of the champion wrestler. So how do you become the world champion wrestler? Do you have to defeat every wrestler? No, you have to defeat the champion wrestler. So the champion wrestler is, in the world of philosophy, the Sankhya philosophy. If you defeat that, that's done, because they have defeated everybody else, <laughs> so to say, so to say. So it's an uh, uh, ancient debate, but as that pundit said, really, really, if you push it hard and you're, if you're fair to both sides, you will see it's, the difference is not all that sharp. When in Samadhi, what you come to appreciate and realize your real nature is exactly the same Atman Brahman which the non-dualist realizes through inquiry.
It's the same thing, uh, same reality. Your conception of it later on or before formed by your philosophy might be a little different. That's all. Swami Brahmananda is reading recently. He is giving instructions to, his, to some monks. And he says, look, I'm going to give you this, teach you this thing. He says, imagine a pot full of water. And he says, now you empty the water out. And then take, take a look and you see, ah, that space. So there's a pot, imagine, it's full of water. Let's say it's full of milk, for example, which is um, not transparent. So it's full of milk. It just seems full. Then you empty it out. Then you see that it's empty. You basically appreciate space there. Now Swami Brahmananda says that that space was always there. Even when it was full of milk, space was there. But you didn't see, and that's how though it was full of milk, because there was space. But you didn't appreciate it because your attention was on the milk or the water. It's only when you empty out the pot, then you appreciate the space itself for what it is. Then he says, what does it mean, this example? He says, you can realize this through Vedantic inquiry. Uh, more or less. But to properly appreciate it, you need yogic samadhi. So that I think is a fine uh, appreciation of the importance of both. To understand it, to appreciate it, to grasp what is being talked about, Vedanta is very useful. To phenomenologically, you know, quote unquote, experience it. Carefully I'm using the language. Yogic Samadhi is very useful. That's why over time, if you see traditional Vedantic monks now in the Himalayas and other places, they of course study the Vedanta, like that monk told me, they talk a lot. But they study, they reason, they argue. But they also spend more and more time in meditation. And as they advance in spiritual life, they spend more and more time in meditation. Not simply sitting quietly. That's a uh, dig. It's a very clear, you get clarity about, about Vedanta and you stay with it. After all, how does one become enlightened? Um, Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, hearing, contemplation, or hearing, reasoning, meditation. Shravana is to hear what we are doing right now. So, so to systematically study these texts, the teachings of Vedanta, and after that, what happens? Your ignorance about your real nature is gone in the sense that you know now, I am not the body-mind. You have been informed, we have been told now that we are not the body-mind, that there is this uh, limitless existence, consciousness. Now I may have many kinds of doubts, many questions, philosophical questions, common sense questions. Those have to be resolved through reasoning. That's the second stage, called manana. Argue it out. Solve Vedanta. So argue it out. And then at the end of the second stage, now you not only know what the teaching is, you have no more doubts. You have clarity now. I get it, you say. The first stage you say, I know what the book says, I know what the teacher says, or I know what the YouTube talk says, but I have many questions. In the second stage you say, I know what it says, and I have no more questions. I've got it now. Yet it's not real if you complain. Yet it's, I, have, I can't really say I'm enlightened. It's not a living reality for me. Then Vedantic meditation called Nididhyasana, a special kind of meditation, where you stay with the clarity already obtained. In a certain sense, you already know, but you are being asked to stay with what you know. Get rid of these distractions of the world. You see how yogic meditation becomes useful there. The whole technology of yoga, of shutting down engagement with the world, of stilling the body, making the breath rhythmic and, per, uh, and conscious, and then turning inwards. All of that is useful in order to enable us to stay with what has already been understood, or has been grasped. Uh, we are still complaining it's intellectual, it's not real for us. Or we are, we are complaining that we are unable to live accordingly. You see? Uh, then this Vedantic meditation. So technically there are three terms, three kinds of obstacles. Ajnana, um, uh, Ajnana, Samshaya, Viparjaya. Ajnana means ignorance. Just a plain kind of ignorance. We, we didn't know this, that I am Brahman. Now you know, you've been told this, you've read it in the books, you've heard the talks, you've attended the classes, you've gone through the books, so now you know it. That's the first stage. The second one is called Samshaya, doubt. I have multiple doubts. Consciousness is produced by the brain. It's not uh, limitless. <laughs> so that's a doubt. 
Our consciousness is instantaneous, flashes of constant consciousness. The Buddhist mind only school says that. That's another doubt. Our consciousness goes away in deep sleep. That's another doubt. All of these doubts are clarified and many, many more, as many as you would like to come up with. Um, they, they are clarified in the second stage. Samshaya, doubt is removed. Then the third problem which will remain is Viparjaya. Viparjaya means contrary tendencies. So I have programmed myself over lifetimes to behave and act as if I am the body. Even now when clarity dawns upon me, I still tend to live and act, as Americans would say, same old dude, <laughs> same old dude. <laughs> so that has to be reversed. The clarity that has been attained, you must, we must immerse ourselves in that clarity and then uh, we have it. You are Brahman and it is directly available to us. It is choicelessly available to us, just like this uh, wood in, the, in this table. Even the language, note the language is uh, tricky. Wood in this table. Is there wood in this table or is the, the table itself wood? Uh, it is, yes, that realization comes. With eyes closed, with eyes open, yes, like the poor yogi sitting quietly, there, there too, the same Brahman, with eyes open in the midst of action like Arjun and the battlefield, there too is Brahman, exactly the same Brahman. Somebody gave a beautiful example. The ocean, it itself rises up into the sky as clouds. And then it rains and the clouds again come down as rain and merge back into the ocean. All throughout, ocean, water vapor, rainfall, ocean again. It's water, water, water all throughout, whatever happens. In the same way, that limitless ocean of Brahman arises as this world. Arises as subject-object, you, the experiencer, and the world that we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, which we engage with, which we love and hate, people, um, objects, actions, life itself. All throughout, it is basically water going up as water vapor, forming clouds and raining back again. And then again, death and merging back into the ocean of life. So, this one consciousness, and Vedanta says, you are this, it is not a drop of water. You are this whole ocean. There is no whole and part relationship here. You are it. This limitless being itself. <clears throat> Alright. All that was the background. Now... But I promise to be quick about it. Tattvatma bodha evaikaha. So what is this realization that I am Brahman? How do you get it? How do you attain it? Let's investigate the core teaching. If it's not sitting silently, then what is it? Well, the first instruction is sit silently. <laughs> no, we draw our attention to the fact that we are aware. That we are conscious. That we know. I'm using these words interchangeably. The knowingness, the consciousness, the awareness, which is always there. Notice, when we were all busy, you're all busy outside, work, uh, coming busily to attend this talk, you are aware. By that, I do not mean we are always self-aware, we are always reflecting back on ourselves. No, we are not. That's a function of the mind. Sometimes we might, if I ask you, are you aware now, and you check, yes, I am aware. <laughs> that checking is not something that we do all the time. But regardless of whether we self-check or not, we are aware, choicelessly so. Vedanta would say, you are aware as choicelessly as this table is wood. You don't have to make an effort for it. You don't have to do anything about it. You are aware. When you are busily coming here, you are aware. And now that we are all sitting here, or we are here, still listening intently, aware. And it's the same awareness. When there is action, physical action, same awareness. Now also, sitting here, quietly, body is still, same awareness. When we are breathing in, so it's a procedure we are going through, right? So follow carefully. When we are breathing in, we are aware. And when we are breathing out, we are aware, choicelessly. We may not, if you attend to it, then I'll say you are doing mindfulness meditation. But even if you are not attending to it, I can guarantee you are breathing. <laughs> because anger may not be satisfied with your breathing, but you are breathing anyway. Just by the fact that you are alive and you have a pulse, I'm sure you are breathing. <laughs> so, you are aware. 
And in the middle of breathing, when there are gaps, if you do yogic breathing and then you withhold the breath for a while, in, when you're withholding the breath also, you're still aware. This self-awareness, checking whether I'm aware or not, that can come and go. That if you try to do, yes you can. If you don't try to do, you're not checking anyway. You're just going with, through with your life. Somebody said that's like a refrigerator. When you open a refrigerator, a light comes on. And you close the refrigerator. And the question is when the, light, <laughs> the refrigerator is closed, is the light on or not? <laughs> There's no way of checking. <laughs> but awareness is there all the time. Even breathing, breathing in, you're aware. Breathing out, you're aware. Holding the breath, you're aware. In fact, if you hold the breath a little longer, a few seconds, you become very aware that <laughs> you're unable to breathe. Then, uh, emotions. If you're happy, you're aware. If you're unhappy, you're aware. We grumble and complain how unhappy we are. We are aware. If you are delighted or depressed, if you are delighted or depressed, we are aware. If we want something, we are aware. If we dislike something, we are aware. If we are irritated, we are aware. If you are peaceful, we are aware. Whatever our emotional state, pleasant, unpleasant, mixed, we are aware. And it's the same awareness. Pleasant states, unpleasant states, mixed states, awareness is the same. Awareness, by that I mean, it gets colored by these states. But by awareness I mean, just the common fact that I am experiencing. When you are unhappy, you're if I ask, if you are, are you experiencing unhappiness? Yes, so you are aware. If you're unhappy, you're experiencing happiness, of course. So you're aware. And is that awareness different? Happiness and unhappiness are different. The emotional effect is different. But the awareness which illumines and gives us the experience of that emotion, that awareness is not different. Our attention is being drawn to that awareness. Now make it even more subtle. Come to thoughts, ideas, thoughts. Just the random chattering of the mind. Aware. When thoughts come and go, you're aware. Just think A, B, C, D right now, you're aware. Just think Om right now, you're aware. And it's the same awareness which thought of something as mundane as A, B, C, D and as profound and deep and holy as Om. Same awareness. And when we understand something, we are aware. When we try to understand something and we don't get it, what is this guy going on and on about? You're aware. <laughs> yeah. Awareness is there. Memory. When we remember things, we are aware. When we try to remember and we can't recall, you say tip of the tongue, it's on the tip of the tongue, we are aware. Whether the memory works or memory fails, awareness is the same, it hasn't stopped working. And thus our days roll into nights and we fall asleep and we dream. We are aware. That awareness which illumined the entire waking world and our bodies and minds and thoughts and memories now the same awareness is illumining the world of dreams. We don't want aware that we are dreaming. We don't know that we are dreaming. But awareness continues. Because how do you know? Experience continues. Dream is an experience. So there must be awareness there. And Vedanta goes on to say, when you shut down the dreams also, there is no way of saying, there is no logical reason to say that awareness has been shut down. Which is, Swami, we don't experience anything. If awareness is there, we must experience. Well, we do experience in a certain sense. We just experience our, just the bare being, just the bare being, without any distinguishing features. That's a new and strange way of describing deep sleep. The usual way is to say that there's no awareness, blankness, no consciousness, no awareness. That's deep sleep. That's anesthesia. No. When you lose all awareness of particulars, of people, places, thoughts, feelings, ideas, memories, sensations, all um, so the uh, knowledge of progression of time, yeah. awareness is still there. Just it's not aware of anything in particular. Deep sleep is, a, is an absence of the objects of awareness. It's not an absence of awareness. It's an experience of absence, not an absence of experience. That's a beautiful way of putting it. So in waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and again the next waking, awareness is. Now note, this awareness, we are not talking about something extraordinary. 
We are talking about something everybody has right now. All of us have right now. All the time. Something that, note, it doesn't change. When we, th when we see different things, when we hear, smell, taste, touch, the objects of our experience keep changing so much. And our experiences are so different. When our feelings change from happy to sad, from liking to disliking, from uh, excitement to boredom, feelings are very, very different. The awareness has not changed. It's the object of awareness which has changed. These are simple but profound insights. So this awareness which we have is always there, effortlessly there, you're not working at it. To sit quietly also you have to do a little bit of work because the body has a tendency to move and you get restless. But to sit quietly you have to put some effort. But to be aware you don't have to put any effort. That awareness. To attend to something, give attention, pay attention to what the Swami is saying, effort is required. But just to be aware, I'm aware of not paying attention, I'm aware that mind is floating around here and there. Awareness is the same. Awareness is always there, effortlessly, changelessly, effortlessly. Awareness is always there, constantly, through our waking, through our dreams, through our deep sleep, awareness is constantly there. Not only is it there, it is what makes all of this possible. Think about it. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Think about it without awareness. If that awareness disappears, if I ask you, are you seeing right now? Say, yes, Swami. Close your eyes. Are you seeing? No, not really, Swami. But are you aware? Yes. When you are open eyes, are you aware? Yes. When you close eyes, are you aware? Yes. Hmm. Awareness is that which makes all this possible. Now, if, now imagine a mind experiment, thought experiment. Imagine that somehow that awareness is not there. You can't do it. But suppose that awareness is not there. Would seeing be possible? If your eyes are open and there are a lot of things to see. Would seeing be possible if awareness was not there? No. Would hearing be possible? L um, tasting, touching, um, would it be possible? No. Would enjoyment be possible? No. Would pain and suffering be possible? No. That's the whole point of trying to give anesthesia. <laughs> so, um, by the way, little something worth thinking about. What people think, or the doctors think when they give anesthesia, the anesthesiologist thinks, is that I'm take, taking away your awareness so that you won't feel the pain. What Vedanta will say is, you're taking away the objects of awareness. Awareness is there. Mm. You're shutting down my senses, you're shutting down the activity of the mind, so that I don't experience the object called pain, or the experience of pain, I don't have that. But awareness is still there. But if that awareness were not there, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, enjoying, suffering, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, life itself wouldn't be there. Our samsara, which we are complaining about, Vedanta, which we are looking forward to, enlightenment, which we are looking forward, none of this would be there if there is no awareness. I say, God realization, vision of God is the goal. But let me ask you, if you have the vision of God, wouldn't you be aware? Of course, otherwise you wouldn't have the vision of God. And would it be the same awareness which is there now? It has to be. This is the one who wants the vision of God. Even the most extraordinary experience of life, samadhi, vision of God, same awareness. Not only that, without that awareness, it's not possible. This is what Vedanta is drawing our attention to. Sri Ramakrishna said, the, the, there was a washerman who found a diamond and you know the Indian washerman he um, cleans his clothes, uh, the, your la laundry scrubs it and beats it on the bank of the river on the stone and then dries it out, cleans it but he ruins your <laughs> laundry also. Uh, but now this poor washerman he used that stone, that amazing diamond, he didn't know what it was, he used it to scrub dirty laundry. But one day he went and asked his friend, the vegetable seller, what do you think this is? The vegetable seller said, it's a fancy stone, I'll give you 10 rupees for it. Luckily, he didn't sell it. He took it to, finally, to one person to another, to finally the, a diamond merchant, who said, this is the biggest, most amazing diamond that I have seen. I'll give you millions of rupees for it. And then he cashed it in and all his wants were removed. Now see, he had the diamond. Not only did he have the diamond, he was using it all the time. He was using it to scrub laundry. 
We have the diamond. This awareness, which is very common for us. We are using it to see, hear, smell, taste, touch. We are using it to remember, uh, forget. We are using it to for our worldly projects. We are using it to enjoy. We are using it to suffer. We are using it for worldliness. We are using it for spirituality. But we don't know what it is. We don't know its real depth, its real value. Vedanta introduces us, it's the diamond merchant. So you have come now finally to the diamond merchant. With a <laughs> you're asking, what is this thing? This I've got a little stone to show you. And the diamond merchant goes, that's me, and goes, wow, you have the best thing in the world, the greatest thing in the world. Are you rich? Good for you. Are you poor? Doesn't matter. Are you learned? Are you ignorant? Are you really, really successful? Are you miserable and down and out? None of it matters because you have the most amazing thing in the world. This awareness, this consciousness. What Vedanta tells us is, you have to realize that this awareness is the fundamental reality of the universe. It is not subject to coming and going. Everything else is subject to coming and going. It is always shining. Everything else is revealed by this awareness. And it itself is also self-revealed. That shining, everything else shines. By its light, everything here is lit up. In the Upanishads, Tameva bhantam anubhati sarvam tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. And that shining, everything else shines. Everything else means the mind shines and the senses shine and the body shines means, not literally, right now I'm shining, but <laughs> awareness, you're aware. And by that awareness, the mind, the senses and the body and the external world is also revealed. The awareness itself. That shining, everything shines. By its light, everything here is, is lit up. It is unchangeable, indestructible. Bodies come and go. They are born and they age and they, they fall sick and they die. Prana, the life forces, they surge like the tides of the ocean. Energy, hunger, youthfulness, uh, zest, tiredness, exhausted, uh, easily, stomach upset, uh, headache, um, uh, feel all the while feeling tired. What happened? You've crossed 40. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> There's prana. There, there, it surges back and forth in your, in your body. Then mind, thoughts, feelings, good, bad, mixed. Intellect, I get it. I don't get it. This is a puzzle. I've changed my ideas completely. Uh, so this is intellect. That keeps changing. All of these waking, dreaming, deep sleep, all of these keep changing. It doesn't change. It is not subject to birth. It's not subject to death. Congratulations. This awareness you are, you are immortal. Lead us from death to immortality. We chanted that at the beginning. Congratulations. You are immortal. You have been introduced to your immortal self. You are that already. You are not subject to disease. Yes, body is. The prana is. You are always healthy. Consciousness is always healthy. It doesn't increase or decrease. More conscious, less conscious, wrong use of words from a Vedantic perspective. It's a mind which becomes more alert or less alert. Even in the most non-alert, scattered, um, tired mind, you are fully conscious. You are just conscious of that tired mind. It became clear to me once, about nearly 30 years ago, I was almost dying. And I wasn't actually, but it felt like that. The doctors called it hypoglycemia. I was on the uh, IV and then the IV had been taken out. Then I forgot I didn't want to eat. And so immediately the sugar levels plunged. And then all this was explained to me later. But at that point I felt I was falling into a deep, dark well. Everything is shutting down. But I was aware. And as we all are, what happens is the typical um, patient will be so focused on the awfulness of it all, forgets the fact you're aware of the awfulness of it all. And the, uh, awareness is not awful at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when they again um, put a needle into you and pump you full of the, what do you call it, the, uh, this, uh, the IV fluids and all that, you feel stronger immediately within minutes. It's the same consciousness. You are not subject to sickness and death. You are not subject to frustration, not depression, even in the most depressed state. I remember this person who had a psychotic breakdown. It was very difficult, but a psychotic breakdown. He was taken to an Advaita teacher. 
And the teacher said, in one of the moments of the lucidity of this patient, the teacher said, in all these storms, you are remember, you are the vast space unaffected by the storm. That's all. What is a storm? What's vast place? He didn't even explain all of that. And that man somehow got it. What, what happened? Did the psychotic episodes come? It came. But before and after, he felt fine. Even within it, he said there was, an, there was a, uh, an island of calm in the middle of the storm. Which is true. So whether physical illness, problems, mental, even social, relationships, societal, community, you'll be much better equipped to deal with all of this when you realize I am this aware. But this awareness is not one awareness among many. Advaita Vedanta goes further. It's much more radical. It says this awareness is the only awareness that there is. It shines through this body and mind as Sarva Priyananda. It shines through that body and mind as Mr. So-and-so, as Ms. So-and-so, and so on. It shines through those bodies and minds as this dog and this cat and this bird. In every sentient being, this awareness is peaking. It's one consciousness. We are all one being, literally. Not all universal brotherhood or sisterhood. That's all fine. But literally we are one. Advaita Vedanta says this. And this one consciousness shining through all bodies and minds is what Advaita Vedanta considers to be God. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Kshetragyam chapi maam vidhi sarva bharata. O Arjuna, know me to be alone, to be the one knower in all these fields of knowledge. Fields of knowledge, all bodies and minds. These billions of people, friends, enemies, fighting against each other, uh, love, love, hate, hate. And behind all of them is that one consciousness shining through. What a radical, tremendous. What Vedanta says, it's completely counterintuitive. But if you plunge a little bit into it, it's first of all extremely logical and rational. One uh, skeptic told me, Swami, I'm not convinced by what you are saying. Very smart lady. She's a neuroscientist. Uh, I explained Vedanta to her once. She got it. She said, I'm not at all convinced by what you are saying, Swami, but I can't find a way to refute your arguments. <laughs> the arguments are tight. They're... So first we see they're logical. It makes sense. Not only that, as our understanding deepens, I'm just saying understanding, as our understanding deepens, we say that no, it's not only logical, but it's just a description of facts. The more and more I study Advaita Vedanta, I see that it's not really a philosophical system. It's just a faithful description of the most fundamental reality of all existence. What's fundamentally here, before everything else, before everything else in your life, you are aware. Awareness is. It's not even you are aware. You are awareness, consciousness, this knowingness. It's blazing forth all the time. And this world, we go further. One more verse, it's very beautiful. I'll do that and stop. Just a few minutes. The second verse. All right, I'm awareness. But what about this world, this table, chair, these people? I am even willing to admit that in all beings, ultimately the background awareness is the same. But what are these minds, this prana, this body, this table, this vast world of sky and earth and stars and planets and whales and um, starfish? What is all this? Second verse. Chidakaram idam sarvam jagadityeva bhavayet sthita ityupashantastha sabrahma kavacha sukhi Idam sarvam All of this, this universe which you experience Chidakaram This is consciousness appearing through many forms That same consciousness which you are you are this universe. As much as the entire world of your dreams, when we dream, and we are not aware we are dreaming, whatever we are dreaming about, whoever we are dreaming about, however good and bad, all of that is I the dreamer. And I realize this the instant I wake up. All of that was me. Similarly, here in this waking world also, all of that, all of this is you. A question here might be, wait a minute. There is so much here that I understand I am seeing all this and it might be appearing in my consciousness. But there is so much I don't see. 
This vast world out, you can't deny that there's a vast world out there. There's whole Central Park and whole of New York and the United States and the Atlantic Ocean and the Earth and the Moon and the solar system and the galaxies, um, countless. I don't know any of them. How can you say they are in my consciousness or in consciousness? They are completely unknown, beyond. And not only so far, why do you have to go so far? Right here in this body. In this body, at um, organic levels, at tissue levels, at cellular levels, at particle levels, so much of activity, tremendous activity is going on. I am not aware of anything. I don't know anything. Doctors might know a little bit about if this probe and find out. I don't know. How do you know? How do you say all of this is in my awareness? Remember, in your awareness, follow this carefully. If you have the question, the answer will be very interesting. Vedanta does not say that you know everything in the sense of um, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, in the sense of a know-it-all. There's only one know-it-all, that's God, Ishwara, Bhagavan. But the sentient being doesn't know it all. You are this one consciousness in which everything in the universe is there appearing as the known, a little bit of it, and the rest of it as unknown. As we deploy our instruments of knowledge, ears, eyes, um, tongue, uh, I mean, um, the um, uh, skin and so on. As we deploy our mind and intellect, we keep knowing little bits of it here and there. Rest of it is in ignorance. Right now, what's behind me, you can see. I can't see it. So it's not something seen. But it's in my consciousness as the unknown. You say, yeah, that's a cop out, Swami. It's, I'm not very clear what you are saying. This example will make it clear. In our dreams, Suppose you, you, are, you don't remember, you're, you don't know that you are dreaming, you are walking somewhere, and there are people around you in the street and the big buildings and all. You are also aware that there is a vast city around you which you are not seeing. Isn't it? In a dream it feels like the waking state. But when we wake up, we realize all of that I saw in the dream and all of that I felt was all around me, a vast universe, all of that was in my dream. It was my mind which generated the known and the unknown. Right now, it is, our consci it is consciousness alone in which the whole thing is appearing. More of this, if you are interested, how to dissolve the universe back into consciousness or how to realize the consciousness, Chaitanya, pure consciousness nature of everything. Everything is consciousness and it's you. This one, see, the interesting thing is, right now, if you are asked, catch hold of consciousness or point to consciousness or detect consciousness. You cannot objectively, but the only place you can find it is you. Right now, if I say chair, you say, yeah, I'm surrounded by chairs. If I say people, yeah, I'm surrounded by people. If you say consciousness, only I. Only I. So this only I consciousness is actually everything that we see is nothing other than this only I consciousness. If you are interested in knowing how to do this, 7th April, First weekend of April, Greg Good is coming. He is a teacher of the direct path of how whatever we experience is nothing other than the experiencing consciousness. And he will guide us step by step into it. So, this is what he is saying. What he is just saying here, the whole session will be an expansion of this one word. Chidakaram idam sarvam. All of this is nothing but consciousness. Iti bhavet. Ittyeva bhavet. This is what you... Stay with this, he says. Bhavayat means meditate upon this or stay with this. It's a fact. Stay with the fact. See, other meditations take effort. Your meditation on, say, the breath. Well, you have to keep getting your attention back to the breath. The breath is always there, but you need to get attention back to the breath. Your meditation on Shiva, for example. Well, you have to sit quietly and visualize Shiva in your heart. It's a quite a lot of work. And stay there. Or meditation on Om or a mantra. You have to keep chanting the mantra in your mind and then f stay with that. All of it takes effort. All of it, the mind flickers. And all of it is difficult because you have to keep coming back to one thing. The breath or Shiva or the mantra. But here, anything and everything that we experience is an occasion, is a doorway to back into this consciousness. Because it is this consciousness. It's just looking at a, a row of pottery, clay pottery and say that, Notice the clay there. Yeah, any pot that you see, any jar that you see is clay. It's available to us all the time. The only way, you know, in dualistic religions we are told, always think about God. But you see, always thinking about God is impossible except in two ways. One way is when that God you are supposed to think about is you yourself. Because you are always constantly available to yourself. 
The second way is the God that you are supposed to think about always is everything. Yeah. Then no matter where you are, with whom you are, whatever the time is, whatever the place is, in space, time and object, you are always immersed in God in that case. In only these two ways it's possible to always think about God. Otherwise, it'll, no, no mind can hold on to one thought all the time, one mantra, one deity. It can't. And this is what has, is being done. In the first verse, we were told that you are this consciousness. Always. The diamond is always there with you. And in the second verse, we are being told everything that you experience is the same consciousness, which you are. And then next. Sthita iti upashantastha. Stay there. Upashanta means quietude, quiescence, calm down. Stay there, calm down. And the only thing that can take you away, it will never take you away, but apparently it's taking you away from that limitless radiance, that, um, the radiance within. It's taking us away is activity of the mind and self-forgetfulness. So, calm down, upashanta. Upashanta means uh, serenity, quietness. Literally means... Quite the silence of the universe. There is a term used in Mandukya, prapancha upashama, the silence of the universe. Once you have detected this, once you know everything that you see is this one limitless radiance, stay. Dogs, you say, stay. <laughs> Tell the mind, stay. <laughs> upashanta. What is this upashanta? Very important. This is cashing in the diamond. See, there are two stages for the poor washerman. First of all, he has to recognize the diamond for what it is. And then the diamond merchant told him. But then he has to cash in the diamond also. And get the benefit from it. Cashing in the diamond is what we have got now. Get the benefit from it. I have just shown you. We have just realized. Oh, it is changeless. It is birthless. It is deathless. I am birthless. I am deathless. I am not subject to illness. I am not subject to poverty, depression. I am not subject to ignorance. None of that. Those are all at the level of the society, body, mind. But I am not. And even the so-called society, body, mind is nothing other than ultimately this one radiance which I am. This is cashing it in. And stay there. With, once you have cashed it in, you will enjoy limitless peace, uh, limitless um, joy and fulfillment. The desires which bound us to this world will be seen as pieces of straw. And this is the burning up of the desires. Sir. Not worth pursuing at all. It makes no difference to me. I can pursue it as a project. Then you see the only desires such people have because of their vastness. Because now they identify with all of us. One Swami said to me, Oh, you know, I'm writing about this enlightened person who is enlightened, but other people don't know he's enlightened. I don't know if he's talking about himself. Other people don't know he's enlightened. Uh, he internally is just contemptuous of the common herd. I was thinking, that's not sign of enlightenment. <laughs> that's just arrogance. That's just... Uh, no, no, no. There will be no trace of arrogance. That person becomes the most ordinary of persons. Most ordinary. There is no desire at all to be become anything extraordinary. Why become extraordinary as one tiny little body-mind when you are the vast, limitless reality of this universe itself? Yeah. Everything in this universe is your expression, whether you know it through this particular body-mind or not. Imagine the limitless peace, the, limitle the fearlessness. One sign of uh, enlightenment is fearlessness. What will you be afraid of? Why will you be afraid of yourself? You're not afraid of anybody or anything in this universe. Or tall talk. So Vivekananda said, uh, an ounce of practice is better than 20 tons of tall talk. So, but all of this has to be cashed in. And this word, iti upashantastha, uh, settle down in calmness. Sa brahma kavacha sukhi. Very nice. It says, this one is happy because he's wearing the amulet of Brahman. Now this is an old uh, um, warrior myth in India. I don't know if it's a myth, but the idea was that there are these magical amulets which you put around your uh, arm. And they're supposed to be, kavacha means armor. They armor you against uh, arrows and uh, swords and all of that. So in the battle you are protected against it magically. Now that's a, an example, a metaphor. Now you are magically protected against the arrows and slingshots of, of time and circumstance of samsara. Therefore, Sukhi, you are truly for the first time, fearlessly, changelessly, uh, 
without any anxiety, happy. This happiness is not the happiness dependent on the ever-shifting sands of fortune in the world. It's not dependent on the undependable body, especially after 40. <laughs> it's not dependent on the even more shaky mind, always subject to anxiety and fear and hopes and desires and um, you know, unhappinesses. Shaky. This happiness is not subject to any of them. It's natural, it's spontaneous, it's choicelessly present. You can't help being happy. Uh, that's why I'm saying that, you know, don't be in a hurry to become enlightened. You lose all, um, all right to grumble about anything if you're enlightened. <laughs> and you cannot be happy, you, you, you not, not be not happy. It's very difficult for you to explain, uh, experience misery. <laughs> No, it's, that's not true. As long as the mind is there, the enlightened one also can experience misery and will experience misery, unhappiness, uh, shock, uh, even anxiety, even fear. One enlightened person sir, told me, that person loses fear of being afraid also. <laughs> then what? If that person, enlightened one also experiences fear and uh, unhappiness and desire and... Yes, but all the time the gates to freedom are continuously open. It's like watching a movie. You can appreciate, you can cry with the movie, you can feel scared in a horror movie, you can feel excited, you can laugh with the comedy. Uh, and that's a sign of a good comedy, a good horror movie and a good tragedy. It'll make you cry, uh, scream in fear and laugh in delight. If it's not, it's not much of a good movie. So this is the best movie that is. And the enlightened one also will get affected by it. But all the time, instantaneously can drop it, which we can't drop. Which we can't drop. Even this most severe illness, Meditation, what will it do? I'm telling you, the body is sick. You're unable to control the body, unable to control the next thought which comes in your mind. How will you practice meditation? I've seen senior devotees unhappily saying, I can't, I can't think about God, so all these things I read, I was taught, it's not coming anymore, Swami. Two, two things. One is, in a devotional sense, I always tell them, don't worry, because, see, our spiritual practice is, it doesn't depend on us really. It depends on God. And God is the sure support of everything. Even when we are unable to do anything at all. If, suppose I am in coma. What mantra will I repeat? What <laughs> deity will I meditate upon? Then am I lost? Not at all. Because God is ever awake. So that's the devotional way of putting it. The jnana, the, this, this one will say, doesn't matter. You are blazing consciousness all the time. All the time. No matter what the state of the body. What the state of the mind. You are free of it. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother Sharada Devi, and Swami Vivekananda to bless us. And in this very life, let this insight uh, arise and free us forever from samsara. Let us awaken to our own spiritual birthright. It's ours. Why should we not have it? Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu so Her question is, uh, the, it seems that the Swami here, the commentator here said that even if you attain samadhi in the yogic path and you come out of it, you will know that you are limitless consciousness, but you're still aware that there is a separate world and other people, limiting circumstances outside you. And that, for example, the state of samadhi and coming out of samadhi, these are two different states. One is better. Yogis think that actually. A friend of mine who is a great practitioner for many, many years and very well known, when I put this Vedantic um, criticism to him, he responded and he said, No, 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 you're misunderstanding. See, what yoga does, you realize, in Samadhi, you realize your limitless, pure consciousness nature. And it's wrong to think that after you come back out of Samadhi, uh, the yoga is not useful in the middle of action. No, yoga is very useful in the middle of action. Your mind is peaceful, it is balanced, it is trained, um, uh, it is centered. Uh, and you are not easily thrown off by uh, problems. All good qualities will be there because of this yogic samadhi. I said, exactly. You are not getting the Advaita criticism. The Advaita criticism is not that in... Uh, Advaita criticism is that 
In yogic samadhi, you are pure consciousness. And notice what you said. When you come out of samadhi, your mind is really great, in good shape, and you can deal with the world. That's not what Advaita wants to say. Advaita wants to say that the pure consciousness, Brahman, Atman, Purusha, which you saw, which you realized yourself in the deepest samadhi, is exactly the same thing with eyes open. In the midst of your office work, when you are cooking, walking, talking, quarreling. <laughs> Don't quarrel. You're quarreling and I'm practicing Vedanta. Swami told me to quarrel. <laughs> In the midst of all, literally, I, I, I'm saying, in the midst of sickness and unhappiness, when you cannot concentrate your mind in meditation, it's exactly the same Brahman and you should be able to say, yeah, it's a fact. That is Advaita Vedanta. Mm. Notice the pushback from the yogi who said, the whole mindset is I access the ultimate reality in um, deepest meditation, samadhi. And then I bring back the fruits of it into this. This is little low grade and bring it back well Advaita says it's not low grade it's the same thing whether it's the ocean or the clouds or the water vapor or the raindrops it's still the same water yes yes experiencing my own awareness what happens in death? Will I be Lord, um, robbed of that? But what happens in deep sleep? Today, when you'll fall asleep and enjoy deep sleep, are you experiencing your own awareness? You say, Swami, I, maybe I am, but in death it will all go away. No, it won't. What happens in death? Only the body goes. Vedanta says the body goes away in death. The subtle body, the mind, the personality still continues and that's what migrates to other bodies and minds. But even that is not your real nature. Yeah, that cycles through birth and death, that, that personality, that, the individual sentient being. That cycles through births and deaths. And that every day cycles through waking, dreaming, deep sleep. But none of that you are. All those are movies playing on the screen which you are. Or in another sense, all of it you are. Both life and death you are. Life and death are movies playing out in front of you, the pure consciousness. In that sense. You know what death is like. Life is, you say, I am experiencing my own awareness. It's like looking at my face in the mirror. And then the mirror is taken away. Oh God, I've been deprived of my face. No, you haven't. <laughs> You're unable to see it anymore. Uh, but if you want, want to see your face all the time, that's narcissism. That's not spirituality. <laughs> you can, if you want to see the face. If you don't want to see the face, if, even if you don't see the face, nothing is lost. That's what happens in deep sleep. It happens in death also. Two questions. The gentleman there, but the lady there, she raised her hand first. I'll come back. Same, same question. All right. The gentleman there. And we'll end with this. <coughs> Listening to you, <coughs> felt that awareness, consciousness, <coughs> and soul, are they same or are they different? These are words. Awareness, consciousness, soul, are they same or different? First of all, first of all, you have to distinguish. Carefully. The Upanishad says, like pulling out a stalk of grass from, you know, pulling out the blade of grass from the stalk. It separates like this. Munja Vaishika. So the grass separates like this and you carefully pull out the stalk from in between. So there's a kind of sharp grass. If you're not careful, it might cut your, actually cut your um, hand. And that grass is used for in the part of the worship. So the worshipper goes and collects that, but has to carefully pull it out. In the same way, not that you have to pull the pure consciousness out of the body mind with the pincers. You have to understand what's being talked about here. Discern it within yourself. And you cannot also. The interesting thing is it's, it's not an object. You can f be aware of the body. Then you can be aware of the breath. In breath and out breath. Follow it carefully. You can be aware of the feelings coming and going. You can be aware of the thoughts. You can be aware of the memories. You can be aware of the intellect which is doing all this work. You can be aware of the blankness also, after everything. But that which is illumining the blankness and the intellect and the mind and the emotions and the breath and the body and the world, that one is consciousness. You have to grasp it by being it. Once you realize what it is, then you will see what we call consciousness, awareness. These words are used differently. Those who read Nisargadatta, they get, keep getting confused. They talk about consciousness arising in awareness. <laughs> so, uh, he says, at death, consciousness is gone. You'll get confused. But Vedanta, Swami said, it's there. 
In the next sentence, Nisargadatta will say, but awareness is always there. <laughs> so, so one must understand in what senses these words are used. So our, what is called vritti jnana in Vedanta, the movements of our mind and senses. This is what we normally mean by consciousness, you see. That, that, that comes and goes. Along with waking, dreaming, along with sensory activity, these things come and go. Along with brain activity, these things come and go. But the background radiance, which you are not even background, that's what you are. Is the wood the background here to the table? No, no, no. <laughs> it's foreground, background, it's everything. It is the ground of the table and it is the table. Pure consciousness, is it the soul, is it awareness? It is the ground of all of that and it is all of that also. Chidakaram idam sarvam jagat itti bhavayet Conceive of this or understand this and stay with this. That all of this, including body, soul, all of that, soul means sukshma sharira in Vedanta. All of that is also nothing other than I, the limitless consciousness. If anything is there other than the limitless consciousness, then the limitless becomes a limited thing. Here it comes and here it stops and then something else starts after this. That is not so. This is a subtle but very profound thing to understand. Once you understand this, it's done. You will heave a huge sigh of relief because then you suddenly see there's nothing else besides you. You have attained to limitlessness. You have attained to fearlessness. But the game of limited life is over for you then. One uh, so song of enlightenment, it says that the, the, the festival nears its end. The market is about to be wrapped up. The market of life. The storm is over. There are Akashi Ramdhanur Mela. There is a festival of rainbows in the sky. Festival of rainbows in the sky means when does rainbow come? When the storms have, and then the rain has stopped and the storms are over, then the rainbows are there. So this is a sign of enlightenment. The storms of life are finally over, of, uh, of multiple lifetimes. And that also sounds scary for some people. No, I want this to go on. All right, go on, take your time. <laughs> take your time. We'll uh, stop here. Thank you so much.